Father, we thank you that we can come here on this beautiful, sunshiny Resurrection Sunday and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, have your way in this church, this service, in the music, in the praise, in the message. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
we have any birthdays? Anybody? have a mic it's right there on the oh she's got one it's on yeah um i want to have a check for a new lock that i found below my old furniture it is grown scar tissue i have no more feet. Totally Amen. Amen. Any other phrases? Colleen. I need to just thank Diana. She's arranged all these beautiful flowers for us. Oh, and yes. The altar. Amen. Decorated church for us. And I think it's, that's great. Amen. It's my pleasure. She's singing it. Yeah, I have a praise. My praise is um, God is Still Rolling Stones, and that's what I'm singing. It's a song by Lauren Daigle called Still Rolling Stones, and I had severely injured my um, biceps tendon where it inserts into the, the radius bone, um, and God healed it. I'm 100% better. Praise God, and thank you, and I praise God I'm going back to work on Tuesday for the first Amen. day. I'm very happy about that. So. God is still performing miracles. Don't let anyone tell you that he's not and that that is in the past and it was only during biblical times. That is not true. It is today. He is still performing miracles. Amen. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking to love came calling rise up rise up rise up rise up six feet under Dug this grave, 
Let's just pray over the offering this morning. Father, we thank you and praise you that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And we celebrate today, we celebrate his resurrection, his victory over death, hell, and the grave. And Lord, as we worship you in giving, we ask that you'd multiply these tithes and offerings to your kingdom's use. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody said, yeah. amen. You can bring forward your tithes and offerings, place them in a basket, and children's church can line up at the door. That was Amen. Hallelujah. That's our future going through the door, those kids. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for our little ones there. I tell you what, they get excited when they get to go back there. They have a good time and they, they learn stuff and they come back and tell us about Jesus. Yes, Bonnie? I have a three you can't be heard unless you're on a mic. I just want to praise the Lord because on the way to church this morning, I've been talking to the kids about the Lord this week, and um, we had all of them in the car with us, and I hollered out, who knows why we celebrate Easter Sunday? And Noah and Mayor, Mayor's only five and Noah's only seven, they both knew why. It's not the candy. It's not the Easter egg hunt. It's not the rabbit. It's because Jesus died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. They know the truth, and I suspect they will be getting some candy today. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's just pray to receive the word this morning. Just pray with me and say, Father God, let me know the truth about Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, of all the events in human history Probably the most momentous thing that ever happened was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people would say, well, Christmas is the most momentous event. But as humanity looked on, a lot of kids had been born. 
he was, Christ was born of a virgin, and that so, certainly was a momentous event. But to have someone come back from the grave, that is, that is awesome. And you know, if you read the Bible and you start in Genesis and you go right straight through to, to Revelation, there's a thing that they call a progressive revelation of our God that he pours out. You can see it from the beginning all the way to the end. And the, the peak of that revelation, the, the pinnacle of the revelation of who God is and how he relates to mankind was Jesus Christ. And let me read Hebrews 1, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets in these last days has spoken to us by his son whom he's appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world hallelujah you know god has spoken to us father god through the birth of jesus and through his death and resurrection and we're living in a world today where Truth seems to be in the eye of the beholder. Beliefs about God and religious practices are said to be whatever works for you is fine. But you know, Christianity is different. Our founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was fully God and he was fully man. He was flesh and blood. And you know, of all the other prophets, of any other quote-unquote religion, Jesus claimed to be something that no other prophet or religious leader claimed to be. He claimed to be God, and he proved it on Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. John 17, 1 through 5, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you gave him. It says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you. When did he have it? Before the world began. Jesus Christ claimed to be God incarnate, and he was. The eternal Son of God was one with the Father when before the world was formed, before all of creation. What really happened on Good Friday? Well, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, was clothed with humanity, with flesh, and he was untouched with the sin of Adam. Why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin? Because otherwise, the sin that infected all of mankind, that infects each one of us in the flesh, would have been on Jesus. And how could he have been sinless and died for our sins if he carried the sin of Adam, the first Adam? You see, we're all sinners and stained with that original sin. Yes, we continue to sin. We continue to do things wrong. But Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says what? The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I think about Resurrection Sunday. I think about everything Jesus said in his ministry, everything he taught, everything he did, the revelation, the fullest revelation of who God is and how much he loves us was demonstrated and proved. Demonstrated on Good Friday because greater love hath no man than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And it was demonstrated on Easter Sunday because death, hell, and the grave didn't hold Jesus. Amen? Amen. He is alive. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5.18 now all things are God, of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them 
has committed us the word of reconciliation. What's the word of reconciliation? Here it is. Jesus Christ is alive. Amen? Amen. 1 John 4, 9. In, in this the love of God was manifest towards us that, well, God, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. Boy, that's a big word. Propitiate, propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? It means the offering, the sacrifice for our sins. You know, all the Old Testament sacrifice, the sacrifices that took place, everything they did with the blood of bulls and goats and everything, that was just a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, and yet he died for all of our sins. <clears throat> He paid the price. If Good Friday was the end of the story and Jesus went in the grave and that was it, we wouldn't be here today. The Christian church probably wouldn't exist. You see, I guess the point I want you to get this morning is Christianity is unlike any other religion in the world. What is religion? Religion is man reaching toward God. If you study the various religions, you'll come to understand that everything except for Christianity is based on works. It's about man measuring up to God, achieving. Christianity, however, is not about man building a ladder to God. It's about God reaching down to us. Amen? Jesus not only died for our sins, he rose from the dead so that we could have new life in him. Hallelujah. And you know, when I think of Jesus Christ on Good Friday and I think of him rising from the dead on, on Easter Sunday, Christianity is God himself sovereignly reaching down taking on flesh and dying for our sins. People sometimes say, oh, God doesn't understand. How can he not understand? He took on flesh. He died in a most horrible way for our sins. You know what crucifixion was? It was the way the Romans had determined they could exert the, the maximum punishment on an individual without killing him immediately, just like they used to give him what was it, 39 lashes, I believe? Because they figured out that 40 would cause you to die. So they, they whip Jesus within an inch of his, his death, and then they put you on a cross and you hang there until basically you suffocate. But you know, I'm so blessed this morning when I think about God and what he went through for us that we might have eternal life. You see, the work of salvation was not done by us, it's done for us. And we can claim no part in it. Romans 5, 8, what does it say? God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, who died? Christ died. All of the glory for our salvation goes to Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 4, by what are you saved? By grace. by grace. Grace is more than something we say at a meal, okay? Grace is God's unmerited favor towards us. We did nothing to deserve his love. Just the opposite, we've done everything as people to deserve his wrath, and yet by grace we've been saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a gift not of works, least anyone should boast. All the other founders of quote-unquote religion on the planet are dead in the ground. They didn't rise from the dead. And you know, each quote-unquote religion has its own brand of truth, its own type of merit system. And I've had people come to me and say, well, 
there's this religion. What, what makes you think your religion is right? Because Christianity's founder, the Lord Jesus Christ, was fully man and fully God, and he overcame death, hell, and the grave. He was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses after his resurrection. If that isn't proof enough to back up all the claims that Jesus made, what is? You know, if you're following one style of religion or another, you have to listen to what Jesus said. He was either telling the truth or he was the biggest liar that ever lived. But he proved he was telling the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, no man comes to the Father but my me. Jesus didn't give us another merit system. He didn't give us a system of works that we had to obtain to, to receive God's favor. He died on the cross that we might be saved. Hallelujah. And you know, Jesus didn't just talk about God the Father. He knew God the Father. He was one with God the Father before creation. He eternally existed. He came down and was made flesh. But that was not the beginning of Christ, the eternal Son of God. John 14, 7. You know, this scripture makes me think a very long time ago. I think I was in my mid-20s or early 20s. And I just had a, made a personal commitment, had a personal relationship with God. And I had a denominational pastor that had the work at the same place I was working at the time. I was only 25, maybe 24, 25, I think. And he said to me, he'd been through seminary and everything. He said, well, Jesus never really said that he was God. You know, and I wasn't that old in the Lord. I read through the Bible, but I didn't know everything. But you know, if you read the Bible and you look, Jesus was pretty clear clear about who he was. John 14, 7, if you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. What is Jesus saying? He's saying this to, to Philip. If you've, you know, if you've known me, you're knowing the Father. Did he say he was the Father? No, he's telling you that he's one with the Father. Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father. It's sufficient for us. And Jesus said, how long? He says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen who? The Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You see, Christianity, and we want to understand that today, that Christianity is not what the world calls a religion. It's not a system of beliefs in the same way that other religions are systems of belief. Christianity is God reaching down and showing his love to mankind and requiring not one thing out of us for that to happen. All we have to do is believe and receive the finished work of his only begotten son into our lives. Getting saved and becoming a Christian is not about getting anything. You don't get anything. It's about receiving. Receiving the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? It wasn't finished on Good Friday. It was finished on Easter Sunday. It was actually finished after Easter Sunday when Jesus was ascended to heaven. Hallelujah. The progressive revelation, the increasing revelation of God and who he was to mankind was complete in Christ in his work on the cross. Let me read Hebrews 1. One through four, God who at various times and various ways spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets 
It says, in these last days is spoken to us by who? By his son, who is appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become much better than the angels, he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The name of Jesus will cause every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me read from Galatians here. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as who? As sons. Hallelujah. And because you are sons, God set forth the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. Hallelujah. Easter Sunday, once and for all, separated Christianity from all religions of the past and all religions of the future. Because on Easter Sunday, Christ backed up everything he taught and said when he came out of that grave. Hallelujah. I think it's important to read the Easter story, the story of the Resurrection Sunday, because, you know, I've heard this so many times. People say to me, well, there's many paths to God. There's this path by this religion and that path by that religion. But, folks, Jesus was clear. He said there aren't many paths. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is only one way that the Father gave us to him to be reconciled to God the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ, through his body and blood, his death and resurrection. Matthew 27, verse 35. And after they had nailed him to the cross, and this is on Good Friday, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there, and a sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Notice the sign didn't say, this man says he is the king of the Jews. It said, this is the king of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one in his right and one in his left. The people passing by shouted, abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. You know, the scripture, Romans 5, 8, that says God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Look at the same people who on, on Palm Sunday were shouting Hosanna to the Son of David as Christ rode into Jerusalem we're now shouting, if you're really the Messiah, come down from that cross. He saved others, let him save himself. It says here, the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law, the elders also mocked Jesus. Who was mocking Jesus? All the good religious folks. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. You know, I think about Jesus on Good Friday hanging on the cross. The more I know about my Lord, the more I understand that God is all powerful. Amen. With a wink of an eye. With just, just a, a breath of a word, Christ could have vaporized humanity and started over. How many of us could endure that type of suffering for people who were shouting insults at us, who were screaming, if you're really the son of God, come down off that cross. And yet God loved us so much 
that he sent his son knowing that that would happen. And Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to lay down his life for us. Well, this part we need to understand. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. And about 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, how many people think that Father God abandoned Jesus? I don't believe that, but I understand what happened there. You see, it says that darkness gathered over the land. We think it might have been an eclipse. I don't know. But what I know that happened is as Jesus hung on that cross, that every sin of every person who would ever call on his name for all time was gathered to him. I can just think of my own sins in my own lifetime. That's pretty black. But what about if you take the total of humanity from that time, for all time, up until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, all who would believe that was gathered to him? It, the darkness was so great that the sun was blocked out from, from noon until, or so, let's say, it says from darkness fell across the whole land while noon to 3 o'clock until 3 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock, all that sin's on him. I don't think God abandoned him, but I think the Father turned his face, just turned his face. Jesus always beheld his Father's face in heaven. He had been one with the Father from eternity past, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were one. And yet with all of our sins gathered there was an instant, there was that moment that, that the Father God turned his face, turned his face from the sin. And Jesus cried out. He cried out because the pain of that moment was greater than all the suffering that he endured up to that point. The Father turned his face. And it says here, some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. And one of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed and a stick so he could drink. But the rest said, let's wait and see whether Elijah comes to save him. Don't you love the crowd? Then Jesus shouted out again, and what happened? He released his spirit. Jesus died in the flesh. And at that moment, something happened that was profound. At that moment, on Good Friday, when Jesus released his spirit, it says at the moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn from top to bottom. It wasn't torn from bottom to top. It was torn where? Top to bottom. No man could have been standing there and pulled the curtain apart at the bottom. It was God that reached down, God the Father, and tore the curtain. What was the purpose of the curtain? Well, the curtain was there, and it would cover the temple part where the holies of holies was, where the Ark of the Covenant was, and the, the Spirit of God sat on the Ark, and, and all of a sudden, when Jesus died, God opened it up. Father God opened it. He tore the curtain apart. Well, you see, he didn't need the curtain anymore because that veil in the, in the sanctuary was no longer needed. All the Old Testament stuff was no longer needed. They were just a foreshadowing. All those sacrifices of the sacrifice that was made on Good Friday. Hebrews 10... 19 says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Folks, no one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. We don't come to the Father through a veil in the temple. We come to the Father 
by the veil, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, 54. You know, who's seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? Anybody seen that? It's been out for a while. That, the first time, I saw it the first time I went to the movie theater. I think I had another pastor with me. We went to watch it. And it depicts the crucifixion, what Jesus went through. And I don't think we understand as people today. That made it a little clearer to me. What a horror. The eternal son of God went through for us. And he died on the cross. It says here, Matthew 27, 54, I'll go back to that. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquakes that happened. So there was an earthquake and the veil was rent. They said, this man truly was the son of God. And many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to care for him were watching from a distance. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and uh, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which has been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. And they told him, Sir, we remember what the deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing the body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Why didn't they want anything to happen at the tomb? Because all of a sudden now they've got fear. Because Jesus said all these things. And they started to just see the signs that he really, truly was the Son of God. And they wanted to stop the news of a resurrection if he rose from the dead. Early Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, many, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. It says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. Hallelujah. He is risen from the dead, just as he said it would happen. Come, see where the body was lying. Now go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. And the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened but also filled with great joy and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them and they ran to him and grasped at his feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to, to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Hallelujah. Well, now you've heard kind of the Easter story read, but don't walk away thinking that this is a story that happened a long time ago about a historic figure, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it doesn't have anything to do with us as believers. You see, that's not just Jesus' story, folks. That's our story. Most of the church, I think, has missed this. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is part of this story. 
Christianity is not a man-made religion about some long-dead prophet or historic character who did great exploits. Christianity is not another ladder to try to scale in good works up to God. Christianity is God reaching down to man, and he lifts us up. Not because of how good and wonderful we are, but how great his love is. Hallelujah. Now here's a verse that people miss sometimes. Romans 6.6. 6. It says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with who? With Jesus. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. You see, Jesus not only took our sins to the cross with him. Folks, he took every single solitary believer for all time to the cross with him. You say, how could that be? Well, how can it be today that if you say, Jesus, forgive me, wash away my sins, save me, Lord, that he'll come into our hearts and save us, and yet he died over 2,000 years ago? It's because time doesn't rule the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord created time. Christ not only took our sins to the cross with him, he took us as well. When we're born again, we are both in Christ and Christ comes and lives in us. The Bible says we have, knowing this, that our old man not will be, not should be, not might be. Our old man was crucified in Christ Jesus. When Christ went to the cross, he took us with him. And when he went to the tomb, guess what, folks? He took us with him. But that's not the end of the story because we know on Easter Sunday, Christ didn't stay dead, did he? And you know what? Turn and tell your neighbor, neither do we. Hallelujah. Christ rose from the dead on Resurrection Sunday. And the church, which includes every single solitary born-again believer for all time, was risen in him. You know what today is, folks? Today is a celebration of Resurrection Sunday the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the celebration of our birthday in Christ. Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, and that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Buried with him in baptism. I don't, most of you know, but way back behind me there, the white thing, that's a big baptismal tank. We got a work day coming up uh, this, this coming Saturday, actually. We're going to be relocating that, being a little easier to use, and we, we need to schedule another baptism. But you know, when I, I've done a lot of baptisms. I've probably baptized a couple hundred or better people over the years in all kinds of different places, pools at a YMCA and rivers and... and uh, at the state park, I've done, I've done all baptisms. And in other churches, they had a baptismal in our own church. But you know, whenever I baptize somebody, I ask them, I say, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And they respond, yes, I have. If they say they haven't, well, then I talk to them about Jesus. And I say, well, upon your confession of faith, in the name of Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what do I do? I put, I, they lean back and they go under the water. They're immersed. What does that represent? It represents being buried with him in baptism. And then I just leave them under the water and I go home. Boy, would I get in trouble for that. Now, we did have at one time... I believe this was in the uh, Plasky Baptist Church because we didn't have a baptistry and Pastor Brett was nice enough to let us use his church, one of the first ones we had. 
And the power of God was hitting people. And when I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, some may remember, I put them under the water, and they went out like a light. They were out. And I'm outside. You, you don't stand in the tank. You stand behind it as the pastor. And I've got a problem here because I can't get them out of the tank now. They're just as peaceful. There's not bubbles coming up, but they're just not moving. And so a couple of our bigger guys, Mike in the back there, and we had a couple other big guys, jumped in, and they're helping get these people up, and we're just laying them on the floor like cordwood. I think some visitors thought we were drowning people up there. I hope not. And they were fine. Everybody was fine. And even the guys that were participating in the baptism, there was such a strong anointing on what we were doing there that they were getting hit by the power of God and falling in the tank. I mean, it was just, it was quite a deal, quite a thing. But you know, you never leave anybody under the water because we are buried with him in baptism, it says here, okay? But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of, fa of the Father, even so, we are raised up. The person comes up out of the tank, and they usually shout, and they're excited. We rise up to walk in newness of life. How does that happen? Because we've been crucified with Christ. Like Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I don't have it in here. But it's, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live through the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. What an awesome, awesome thing. Folks, people think about Easter, and, and we, it's good to think about Jesus, but you know, it's more than a story about Jesus who died and rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. It's our story today. Amen? Amen? If Christ is your Savior, you've been buried with him in baptism, and you've been risen by an operation of faith. Now, baptism doesn't save you, okay? And there's scripture on that. It's a pledge of a good conscience towards God. What, is it, what does it mean? It means that when you're baptized, you're depicting what takes, what takes place or what took place on Resurrection Sunday, that Christ went in that tomb and he was risen from the dead. And we go to the cross with Christ. We go into the tomb and we are risen with him. Hallelujah. Even one step beyond that, the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. John 3, 5 through 8. It says, Jesus answered, more so surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So it is everyone born of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that anybody's in Christ, they're a new creature. Why? Because you've been dead and buried with Christ, and you're risen with him. Hallelujah. By that operation of faith. Romans 6.11, it says... You also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You count yourself. What should Easter do for us? What should Resurrection Sunday do for us? The Bible says we need to count ourselves as being dead to sin, but alive to God. We need to count ourselves and understand that when Christ died on the cross, we were crucified in, with him. We went to the tomb with him, but Easter Sunday reminds us that we're resurrected with him. Hallelujah. Let's all, let's all stand. We're going to have communion in just a minute. And uh, we're living in a different world than we lived in before COVID because now everything's online. And Boy, there's a lot of people watch this service online. I don't know where everybody's at as far as their personal walk with the Lord. But the Bible says, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says, you will be saved. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, for the heart one believes into righteousness, 
And with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Hallelujah. And I invite you today, maybe Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Maybe he isn't. But you know, today is the day of salvation. Hallelujah. If you're already a believer, I invite you to pray after me and recommit your heart to the Lord. If you've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, never asked him to be your Lord, to come into your heart and wash away your sins, his blood is as fresh today. The work of the cross is as fresh today. The work of his death and resurrection and ascension is as fresh today for everyone who calls on his name as it was back then. Let's just pray. Just pray after me and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you died on Good Friday. Not for your sins, but for my sins. Lord, I ask forgiveness for my sins. Wash them away with your shed blood. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Save me, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd ask uh, uh, maybe communion. We got a couple of people already? Good. Amen. And just by means of announcement, we're getting, like I said, on Saturday, we're going to make move the tank a little bit. I think it's coming off of the platform. We're going to move it down. But we are planning to have a baptismal service. If you haven't been baptized and would like to be water baptized by immersion, um, we're going to schedule a service. If you, if you can't be water baptized by immersion, we can still baptize you. Amen. And you know... I grew up in a mainline denominational church, and I was, quote, unquote, baptized as a little baby. I remember my mother, God rest her soul, she said, you scream bloody murder the whole time. That's probably pretty much what kids do. But when I got old enough, when I got older, I even made my, I was in the Episcopal church, and you have a confirmation when you're a little bit older. I think I was 12 or something, and, and, uh, but when I was 24 years old, God really touched my heart. I asked him to be my Lord and Savior in a personal way. And I was baptized by immersion. And I'll tell you what, it is an awesome, awesome thing. And we really are crucified in Christ, buried with him through baptism and risen by an operation of faith. So if you'd like to participate in that, just let me know. We'll be scheduling it soon. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we rejoice on this Resurrection Sunday that you loved us so much that you sent the Lord Jesus to die for our sins, that he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and he rose on Resurrection Sunday, and we rose with him that we can now walk in newness of life. And Lord, we remember that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, the Lord Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take and drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you'll drink it in remembrance of me. And Lord, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, we remember 
Lord Jesus, that it's through your body and blood that we have life and life abundantly. In your name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 You are dismissed.